All right. Hello, everyone in the room and online. Welcome to our HAI lecture series. And I believe this is our first hybrid one. So we have our speaker here with us in person, which is awesome. And then also, obviously, hopefully visible and audible to you all online. Um, so it is my absolute pleasure today to introduce Dr. James Serple, who is a true pioneer in the field of human animal interaction. Um, he's been a professor of animal ethics and welfare in the School of Veterinary Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania since 1993. And he's also a founding member, member of the International Society of Anthrozoology, um, which promotes scientific research and collaboration among researchers in the field of human-animal interaction. His contributions are wide ranging and have helped us better understand the effects of pet keeping on the people and the animals. Um, and he's also an expert in companion animal behavior. Uh, so cats and dogs, and he has created the world's most ubiquitous survey assessment of um, canine behavior. And it's used by pet owners and working dog organizations alike. And I'm thrilled that he's gonna be sharing more about um, that research with us today. And with that, I'm gonna turn the floor over to him. Thank you. Anybody's face. Yeah. Um, thank you uh, very much for inviting me here. It's a great pleasure to be getting away from Philadelphia, gray and murk and cold and snow and that sort of thing. We'll come to the beautiful Tucson. Um, and uh, I want to talk to you today a bit about some work we've been doing, which uh, are following up on a long kind of uh, history of work with this instrument called the CBARC, the Canine Behavioral Assessment and Research Questionnaire, and uh, trying to raise the question of how far we can go with this type of tool for measuring behavior in dogs or um, potentially other types of animals, similar instruments. Um, before I go any further, I've got to acknowledge, oh, where do I point it? Why is my thing not advancing? Uh, can I do it through this? No? Somebody help. <laughs> so yeah, move your cursor over to your presenting picture and click on it once. On the side. It's frozen. Not ah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Sorry. Uh, got to acknowledge a lot of people who've helped along the way, most especially Yu Ying Xu, who really was the sort of brains behind the sea bark in the early days. That's Yu Ying outside the National Museum in Taipei. She's now a professor of um, behavioral ecology, I think, now at uh, uh, National University in uh, Taiwan, but many other names, Deborah Duffy, Kathy Kruger, and so on. Um, also need to acknowledge a lot of organizations and funders for a lot of this work. Um, I'm sure a lot of those logos are familiar with many of you. Um, I got going on this basically in the mid-1990s when uh, Donald Patterson, who was then professor of medical genetics at the University of Pennsylvania, came into my office. He was at the time he was uh, in the scientific advisory board for the um, the Seeing Eye, the guide dog organization based in uh, Morristown, New Jersey. And um, he said to me, um, we have a problem at the Seeing Eye. And I said, oh, yeah, what's that? He said, we have all these dogs that are basically flunking the training due to behavioral problems. And um, you know, we wondered whether you'd be interested in doing research on this. And I, of course, said, oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And um, this is the gist of the problem. That this is the outcomes for uh, about uh, eight and a half thousand dogs representing five different U.S. guide and service dog organizations. So this is a a, a pool. These are pooled uh, data, but um, roughly the same number of dogs that are successful are released or rejected for behavioral problems of one kind or another. A smaller proportion are rejected for some kind of medical issue. Um, so it's obviously a big deal, and it's uh, causing a lot of uh, wastage, if you like, in the system. So I then went out and spent, um, oops, no, that's not right. I then went out and spent, um, will that go away? Probably. 
Um, spent about two months. Oh no, now it won't respond anymore. <laughs> oh God, what have I done? Let's see if it will respond. Yes, thank you. I went out and spent about two months um, in Morristown, New Jersey, following seeing eye dogs through the paces, being trained on the streets of Morristown, and I went to the where they were whelping the puppies, and I spent hours and hours and hours talking to guide dog trainers and handlers and supervisors and so on, trying to get a feel for the early life of a guide dog. And the goal there was to try and identify the best time to start actually observing um, guide dog behavior, if I was going to do that. Um, I quickly decided that I didn't put much faith in early puppy testing. Um, most of the evidence at that time suggested puppy testing wasn't very predictive, so early puppy tests. So I ignored that. Um, I discussed with them the idea of... Um, doing some tests with dogs that were returning from their time at the puppy raises. Um, and there was a lot of discussion around that. We did eventually develop some tests which were implemented, not at the Seeing Eye, but at other guide dog organizations. Um, but uh, in the end, I decided the real gap in knowledge was what was happening to the dogs at the puppy raiser. Um, and I thought, well, we need to somehow find a way to get information from these puppy races that we can usefully use um, to uh, identify early onset of behavior problems and maybe even make predictions from these early signs of behavior problems um, about the likelihood that these dogs would not be successful further down the line. Um, now, the... Oh. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> So, studying behavior in people's homes is obviously difficult. This is a kind of natural habitat for many dogs, uh, especially in Europe and North America. Uh, some people have tried it. They've tried to do a sort of fly on the wall, participant observer type observations of dogs and other pets in the home, but it's not easy. And sample sizes tend to be very small, so it wasn't ideal. And uh, so, basically, I kind of reverted to the approach taken by a lot of child psychologists who tend to rely very heavily on surveys and questionnaires given to parents, teachers, and so on. Um, and so I thought, well, let's look around, see what kind of equivalent instruments are out there. I came up with this one, the Middle Childhood Temperament Questionnaire, seemed to be right up the, the right street, so to speak, uh, based on existing hypotheses about, you know, what sort of behaviors uh, define temperament in children, uh, turning those into a series of uh, questionnaire items or statements and, and then getting parents and teachers and so on to complete them. And uh, they were able to do exploratory factor analysis on these and obtain these uh, subscales or factors. And um, they could check the internal consistency and the reliability and so on of these things. So I thought, this is the way to go. And um, so, first of all, we went out and... Uh, did this for the puppy raisers at the Seeing Eye. Uh, this was the publication that eventually came out of that. Um, we developed a questionnaire. It was designed for puppy raisers. It was designed to measure domains of behavior that seemed to be important in terms of predicting success in uh, these animals. And um, it turned out that it was surprisingly successful. We were lucky in the Seeing Eye when they failed a dog they put in its record a behavioral reason for failure. And those are listed along the top of that chart. Um, so things like suspicious of people, lack of confidence, aggressive towards dogs. The domains of behavior that we developed with our survey instrument um, uh, using exploratory factor analysis in the same way had uh, are shown down on the left-hand side there with things like stranger fear, stranger aggression, non-social fear. And you can see that... Um, Basically, dogs that failed for these reasons tended to score badly on the, subs the, the survey subscales. Uh, there were a few anomalous ones like um, uh, uh, aggressive towards dogs being associated positively with trainability, which is kind of, was we thought a bit weird, but most of them um, uh, seemed to make a lot of sense. So this was very encouraging. And um, at that point, I thought, well, you know, if we can do this for 
seeing eye puppy raises. Let's just do it for <laughs> dog owners in general. So that's where I really got going. And I could see all sorts of other applications for this type of research, obviously with animal welfare. We know that behavior problems are the number one reason why um, dogs die prematurely or are abandoned by their owners. Um, uh, it's a contributory factor in 40, 40 to 50 percent of all shelter relinquish, uh, relinquishments. Uh, there are big public health concerns from to do with canine aggression. You know, 4.5 million Americans bitten by dogs every year and so on. Um, and then, of course, the possibility of developing an instrument that was so sort of uh, sort of global that you could then apply it back to the working dog community. So that's where we went. We started off all this was paper and paper and pen. You have to remember this before the Internet. Um, we had uh, we recruited a sample of dog owners through our, the, vet, the veterinary hospital at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, we eliminated any dogs that were had health chronic health problems or behavioral problems, uh, but there were no breed restrictions. So we had 758 dog owners. Uh, we then also recruited some breed club members to look at specific breeds. The choice of breeds was totally arbitrary. It was just whichever breed clubs agreed to do it, uh, basically. Um, and then we also uh, recruited a sample of 200 owners of so-called problem dogs, dogs which had actually been referred to a trainer or a behaviorist um, to with a behavior problem. And we wanted to use that sample to validate the instrument. Um, this was our questionnaire format. I'm just putting that there to show that some of our scales, our questionnaire scales, focus on the severity of behavior. And that was particularly with things like aggression and fear, whereas other scales focus on frequency. Uh, uh, so just a point to make. At the end of our uh, factor analysis, we finished up with 14 subscales. I'm kind of contracting what happened actually a bit here just for the sake of brevity, but um, we got these uh, four separate subscales focusing on aggression, aggression addressed, addressed towards strangers, unfamiliar people, aggression towards members of the household, familiar people, aggression towards unfamiliar dogs and aggression towards familiar dogs, and they separated out. Uh, we also had a lot of fear or anxiety type items, fear of strangers, fear of dogs, fear of things that go bump in the night, you know, thunderstorms, traffic, um, attachment and attention-seeking behavior, separation-related behavior, touch sensitivity, excitability, energy, chasing, that's predatory, chasing, and finally trainability. And uh, we've subsequently found that this factor structure is quite robust. It's been replicated in a whole host of different dog populations across the world from Iran to Canada. Um, we also included in the questionnaire a bunch of what we just call miscellaneous items. These did not load on any of the main factors. We included them just because we knew people don't like them <laughs> in their dogs. They're sort of just kinds of things that people aren't thrilled with. Um, so it ranged from coprophagia through to various kind of stereotypical compulsive type behaviors, uh, persistent barking, that kind of thing. Uh, I just want to emphasize that the CBARC is not a personality evaluation. It was never designed for that. People sometimes refer to it in that, as that in the literature, but it, it's really not that. It was designed to measure behavior problems. So, yes, um, in 2005, finally, we were able to put this survey online. Um, it consists of 100 questions. Um, they're all very everyday kind of situations and stimuli that most dogs will encounter at some point. Uh, they're all these five point rating scales. The owner just has to say, you know, how, how severe the behavior is or how frequently they see the behavior for each of these scales. Um, and uh, the database at the University of Pennsylvania now contains behavioral evaluations for about 100,000 
pet dogs and about 40,000 working guide or service dogs. So it's a big chunk of uh, information about uh, dog behavior and it continues to grow. It's not, we don't actively advertise it, but it's just kind of spread by word of mouth. Um, and a lot of people use it now. In terms of reliability, well, we did early stuff looking at um, internal reliability, so-called Cronbach's alpha coefficients, and they're all uh, within a, an acceptable range, except for touch sensitivity, which is a little bit low. We could probably increase that by increasing the number of survey items, but we're, we're not that fussed about it. Um, the uh, average percent agreement between two members of the same household is pretty high. Uh, for the subscale items, it ranges from 82 to 97%. And uh, one month test retest reliabilities are also acceptable. So they range from 0.48 to 0.93 for the subscales and from 0.45 to 0.94 for the miscellaneous items. So we're reasonably comfortable with the level of reliability. The validity was, <laughs> that was a trial. Mm -hmm. um, so that involved uh, recruiting some either veterinary behaviorists or other kinds of behaviorists who were seeing samples of owners who were, were treating dogs with behavior problems, essentially. We managed to recruit six of them who said they would help us. Um, their task was to inform us when a client contacted them with a dog with a behavior problem. We then sent the client a copy of the questionnaire uh, with a return envelope that they put the questionnaire in and sent back to us. So the practitioner, the, the behaviorist, never saw the CBAR results. Uh, then, after the dog was treated and the animal had been given a diagnosis, we then got those diagnoses back from the <laughs> clinicians or the trainers and, said, and, and then had to make sense of the diagnosis, which is really difficult because there's no standardized diagnostic criteria for dog behavior problems. Everybody's using different terminology. But uh, after a lot of backward, back and forth and getting on the phone and saying, well, what did you mean when you said the dog is such and such? And um, we were able to classify all these diagnoses into groups. Those are the groups that we could identify consistently and clearly. And um, then we basically compared dogs with the diagnosis with dogs that did not have that diagnosis um, uh, from all of the, the sample we had. And uh, you can see that it worked out very nicely that the um, what you have here is the diagnosis at the top. This is our the CBARC, Stranger Directed Aggression subscale. Uh, these are the dogs that did not have the diagnosis and these are the dogs that did. And you can see very clearly that Dogs with that diagnosis scored much higher on that scale of the CBARC. Um, similarly, for all these other ones, this is aggression towards owners, fear of strangers, fear or aggression towards dogs, and uh, separation anxiety. So in every case, we got nice, uh, uh, um, clear distinction. There were a few which were a little less clear, but it didn't altogether surprise me. Um, we couldn't validate all of the CBARC scales using this method because they don't they don't go to behaviorists, I guess. Um, just for fun, we replicated this recently. Um, this was um, data we collected for the this study in I think this was last year, twenty twenty one, I think, um, <coughs> and um, exactly the same result, pretty much. The, uh, these are the diagnosed dogs. This was just all from one behavior clinic, the, the one at the behavior clinic at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, these are the dogs that didn't have that diagnosis. And these were all the dogs in the CBARC database as a comparison group. And you can see the diagnosed dogs are standing out from the pack, so to speak, in terms of their CBARC scores being uh, much higher. Since then, a lot of other studies have sort of looked at construct and criterion validity in the CBARC, um, looking at things like training outcomes and working dogs, behavior of dogs and standardized tests and test batteries of various kinds, uh, neurophysiological markers of canine anxiety disorders, 
and even genetic loci known to be associated with brain loop behavior. So, so on balance, it's coming out to be quite a, a relatively accurate instrument, um, if you like. One question that often comes up, understandably, is how representative all these CBAR data are of the dog population. Uh, we, it's hard for us to say uh, for sure, but one thing we can do, we do have ask some background questions of the dog owners, like whether the dog spayed or neutered or where they got it from. And there is independent data from you know national surveys that we can compare that with. So uh, this is a comparison with um, the American Pet Products Association survey of 2015, 2016. And you can see uh, the blue bars are the CBARC data, and this is the APPA survey. And we get exactly the same number of dogs spayed or neutered, uh, slightly fewer being acquired from breeders in our sample, very slightly fewer purchased from pet stores, uh, somewhat more, uh, somewhat less um, acquired from friends and relatives, about half as many, and rather more acquired from shelters and rescue groups, and no difference in terms of rescued as a stray. Uh, what that says to me is that it may be that the Seabark sample, at least in terms of dog owners, is slightly different. They are sort of leaning towards people maybe with a more welfare-focused interest in dogs, which is not totally surprising um but uh i think they're close enough to allay some of the concerns about representation so this is what you see if you go on the website now this very sort of official looking website and you can sign up and you can complete this for your dog or you can register as a group and um uh, now we have quite a lot of groups using it um so we uh have a lot of uh, working dog organizations screening or evaluating their dogs using the CBARC. We have um, an interestingly increasing number of shelters and rescue organizations using it to evaluate dogs that are being relinquished to the shelter or using it with fosters, uh, people who are fostering dogs temporarily for the shelters. Uh, more and more canine behaviorists and trainers are using this is a diagnostic tool. I'm not sure I, I totally approve of that, but hey, if it helps, I'm okay with it. Um, and then finally, uh, an interesting new one that is growing is breeders. Dog breeders are, are following up with people who purchase puppies from them to see how the dog is doing behaviorally post-adoption, post-purchase, um, which uh, I would like to see more of that actually. Now, uh, it was originally designed for as a research tool, and it's found a lot of use in research now. There are roughly 150 published studies uh, that have used the CBARC. Some of those are just kind of rather boring CBARC psychometrics, looking at reliability and validity and that kind of thing. Um, it's increasingly used to validate other behavioral assessments and tests. Um, it's used as a diagnostic screen, for example, if you want to do a study that just focuses on one particular type of behavior problem, you use it to select a group of dogs for that study. A um, lot of correlates and risk factors for the development of behavior problems in dogs, which was kind of the purpose for which it was originally developed. Uh, people are using it to examine the effects of interventions um, on behavior problems. A lot of studies now of behavioral comparisons between different dog breeds and populations. Um, and then uh, some interesting neurological studies. Uh, for example, Erin Hecht at Harvard has been, done some really fascinating stuff where she's looked at breed average CBARC scores and brain anatomy and found some very interesting associations there where certain parts of the brain are growing and shrinking according to uh, the behavior of the breed, so to speak. Um, uh, behavioral and phenotyping in studies of behavioral and evolutionary genetics. Evan over there has been a pioneer in that area, mm -hmm. done a great study, uh, very interesting on uh, using uh, CBARC breed averages. Uh, and uh, finally, measuring predicting performance in working dogs. And that's really where I'm going to go next uh, with the rest of this presentation. 
I'm going to talk about two studies, sort of kind of related, but not. Um, one of them very much so to, you know, specifically focused on measuring, predicting performance in working dogs. Um, so we have some previous studies, one of them by uh, my colleague, Deborah Duffy, who analyzed um, nearly uh, 12,000 CBARC evaluations from uh, 700, sorry, 7,696 guide and service dogs at both six and 12 months. Those dogs belong to five different organizations who all agreed to kind of join in this consortium study. Uh, and we looked at the ability of basically the CBARC to discriminate between successful and released dogs in training. And what we, one interesting thing that we found was that it varied a lot across organizations. So some organizations, it was much better than others at predicting success. And that raises some interesting questions. Um, but overall, uh, these evaluations performed at six and 12 months were significantly better than chance um, at making predicting success the area under the operating receiver curve, if you AUC, if that means anything to you, was between 0.64 and 0.72. And um, then uh, Emily, our very own Emily, did a study in 2019 focusing just on canine companions dogs. Uh, and in this study, they uh, were predicting success or graduation in a sample of three and a half thousand dogs. Uh, they used uh, generalized linear models. And one of the models performed significantly better than chance with a, an AUC of 0.71. But what was really interesting was it was much better with the dogs that were predicted to be unsuccessful. So it was much more accurate. Um, predicting unsuccessful dogs than predicting successful ones. In fact, in terms of predicting successful dogs, it was useless. Um, now, if we, if the CBARC was something like a diagnostic test in medicine, an AUC of 0.7 would be considered just fair, maybe um, because of the large number of false positives. So, you know, this results, these results aren't great. And that prompted me to start thinking about possible explanations for why we can't get better at doing this. And um, there are a number of explanations you could come up with. So it may be that we've simply reached the upper limit with this type of proxy measure of behavior at predicting performance in working dogs. And that would be just due to pretty much uncontrollable factors. So there's obviously going to be a, some inherent subjectivity and inaccuracy in these puppy razor reports. Um, also, there's um, the issue of maturational changes in the dogs. The dogs are being evaluated by the puppy razor at six and 12 months, but the final decision about whether or not the dog's gonna be successful is often a, you know, a year later. So you would expect some changes in the dogs over that time. There's also some variation in how organizations uh, judge success. So it's kind of a supply and demand kind of situation. If there's, if the demand exceeds the supply, then dogs that would have previously failed suddenly become successful and that kind of thing. So it's a kind of slightly shifting goalpost. And we can't really do much about any of those things. So it's not really worth getting upset about. But the other possible explanation is that the CBAC just doesn't currently measure all of the behavioral domains that are important for predicting success. And so we decided to pursue that line to see if we could improve essentially the CBO, uh, add new dimensions to it. So we set about doing that. We're calling it the working dog CBOC. The first paper on that is in under review with Frontiers and Veterinary Science, so hopefully it'll be coming out sometime within the next year. Um, the we reduced, we decided we'd reduce the original number of CBARC items. There's a lot of them, a hundred items. Um, and in some of these, most of these working dogs, uh, you don't need that many items. Uh, so things like aggression has already been filtered out in you know, most of these working dogs. So, yeah, you should include a few items that address aggression, but you don't need whatever it is, 10 or 12 or something like that. Um, so uh, we 
trim these items, a lot of these items. We reduce, for example, the aggression items from 26 to 12. We reduce the fear and anxiety items from 26 to 14. And we added questionnaire items addressing these four new domains here, uh, playfulness, uh, impulsivity, distractibility, and what we're calling basophobia or fear of falling. Um, and I'll explain more about that in a minute. <laughs> Our sample in this case was not guide dogs or service dogs, but detection dogs, odor de detection dogs. This work was funded by Department of Homeland Security, and um, we were working with uh, primarily with uh, Transport Safety Administration dogs down at Lackland Air Force Base. But uh, <laughs> because of COVID and various other things, we couldn't get access to those dogs, so we decided to do a totally separate survey of um, handlers of detection dogs. So we recruited uh, over a thousand of these uh, handlers uh, from uh, various organizations through conferences, social media, and so on. <laughs> Due to a clerical error, um, the first version of the survey that went out online was missing the chasing items from the original CBOC. Uh, I mean, I take full responsibility. Um, we, as soon as we discovered it, obviously we put it back in, but by then we'd already recruited about 600 um, plus dogs, but we, we recruited a further 430 that did have chasing, but uh, that was not deemed to be enough uh, for some of the analyses. Anyway, um, there are various breeds, mostly United States. And these were the new items we added. Um, so playfulness, uh, dog e eagerly engages in play with new unfamiliar people. Dog is highly toy focused, attention riveted on tug to toys, balls, and so on. Dog e eagerly initiates play sessions and dog hunts persistently for thrown or hidden objects, not easily distracted from this task. This, this subscale is very focused on detection dogs because the whole detection dog community uses play as a training medium. That's how they train their dogs by play. And they, they go for dogs that find this kind of play hugely rewarding. Um, impulsivity, dog is impulsive, doesn't seem to think before he or she acts. Dog becomes frustrated, impatient in a wide range of situations. Dog is difficult to interrupt or distract when doing things she wants to do, and dog displays repetitive behavior, circling, pacing, barking, tail chasing, et cetera, when unable to access something he or she wants. So those are those. Um, in terms of distractibility, we had a lot of items. Uh, dog becoming highly excited or distracted when encountering unfamiliar dogs. Dogs becoming highly excited or distracted when encountering unfamiliar people. Distracted by odors. Um, distracted by other interesting or distracting things, dogs, odors, people, small animals, uh, distracted or nervous in new or unfamiliar environments, has difficulty maintaining focus, and uh, slow to recover after being distracted or stopped. It takes a long time to resume normal activity or work. And then this base of phobia one, um, this is about dogs that are uh, reluctant or nervous about crossing grates, crossing shiny or slippery floors, or ascending or descending some types of stairs, most specifically these stairs with open risers. A lot of dogs don't like doing that. It makes them very uncomfortable. In terms of validation, unfortunately, detection dogs are not currently uh, subject to the kind of rigorous uh, testing of success and failure that service and guide dogs are. Um, so we basically just invited our, the participants in this uh, study to rate their dogs before they completed the CBARC. And we asked them to rate them on two scales. One was just general behavior and temperament, um, how ideal the dog was on a scale of one to 10 and also how good the dog's scent work was, how its working ability was on the same one to 10 scale. And we used that as a, a way of 
uh, looking at, at associations with the uh, these new new or old C bug variables. Um, the factor analysis was encouraging in the sense that you know when you throw new questionnaire items into an old and established questionnaire, it can do horrible things. All of a sudden, your original factors fall apart and everything goes everywhere. That did not happen. I'm happy to say, or at least it ha it happened very minimally. So these were. All of, these are all original CBARC factors, and they all held together more or less. The one that fell apart a bit was dog aggression. There wasn't a separate um, a separate ag aggression towards familiar dogs, but there was one up that the familiar dog items tended to clump with the unfamiliar dog items. Um, so we lost one subscale, a dog rivalry subscale. Uh, we also lost a number of others, but I'll, I'll tell you about that in a minute. Um, the chasing factor had to be excluded here, so I separately went in afterwards and did a very quick factor analysis with in just on the 430 dogs that had chasing, and luckily chasing is still separate. It's a totally independent factor. Um, the playfulness items, four items came out in that factor. Um, in impulsivity, there were three items, but only two of them were the ones we'd brought in. And instead, the old original hyperactivity item from the miscellaneous scores was clumped with that. And that, actually, that makes sense based on the literature on hyperactivity type, uh, ADHD type syndromes in dogs and people. Um, basophobia, those three items clumped together, stairs, floors, and grates. And then distractibility items, um, most of them uh, uh, were fine. We dropped two. I'll, I'll show you which ones we dropped. And then we got a new factor that's never seen before called food focus. And that maybe that's something unique to uh, detection dogs. I don't know. These were the items that got dropped. Uh, so three trainability items got dropped. The reason for dropping them were often simply the... Uh, well, there were statistical reasons so sort of to do with collinearity and so on, but there were also, um, like with owner-directed aggression, there were too many zeros. So, so many dogs never showed this behavior that it, we couldn't do anything with it. It was just, it was the same with non-social fear. Um, so we lost two subscales, non-social fear and owner-directed aggression. Uh, this impulsivity one, so these were the two items that got dropped, difficult to interrupt or distract when doing things she or he wants to do, and repetitive behavior when unable to access something she wants. They did not load on where, where we thought they'd load. And then with distractibility, the only one that got dropped was uh, becoming highly excited or distracting when distracted when it encountering unfamiliar people that got dropped and one of the original trainability items was grouped with distractibility so that's that's what happened basically in terms of validation well i just i mean these these are all c the new c bark factors are they all correlated with handler assessments of general behavior uh, significantly all of these did but when we ran a regression, really four just stood out dramatically. And, and there, for general behavior, stranger directed fear here stood out as being very influential. Um, distractibility stood out as being very influential. And um, energy level and uh, impulsivity. Uh, energy level was a positive association. So high energy dogs were perceived as good in terms of behavior but all the others were negative so distractibility was bad impulsivity was bad stranger directive fear was bad and um, in terms of uh scent work ha handlers assessments of scent work same just four came out not exactly the same distractibility this time is the number one reason why the handlers are perceiving these dogs as being far from ideal. Um, energy is still positive, uh, but chasing and training difficulty are negative. So 
this was very encouraging because, you know, two of those factors are new factors, which kind of was what I was hoping. I was hoping we would be, you know, adding value to the original CBOC by adding these new domains. And it does look as though we have. Um, so just our preliminary conclusions, um, sort of based on these handler assessments, distractibility, which is to do with inattention or lack of focus, is one of the most significant um, working dog CBOC factors, um, predicting both general behavior and scent work in detection dogs um, in a negative way. The same trait is likely to reduce training or working success rates in other categories of working dogs. Um, so distractibility is going to be an issue almost with any kind of working dog, as far as I could see. Um, and that would include assistance dogs and probably actually is a big factor with relationships with pet dogs. Um, if you've got a dog that can't focus, is inattentive, it's going to be much more difficult to train. It's going to be, it's going to be a pain. Um, and also given the distribution and variability of this trait in this well, at least in this dog population, which is shown on the here. So it's, it is skewed towards, you know, zero, but there's still quite a lot of variability. There's a lot of uh, uh, room for selection, if you like, there. Uh, so it's likely uh, going to be amenable to mitigation. And on the, in terms of genetic selection, I mean, it's kind of interesting that we already have evidence that there are some genetic loci which are associated with this type of behavior problem in dogs. Um, so it's it's very encouraging. Now, uh, there's I guess there's time. Yeah, um, I'll go quickly on to the other study, which have been kind of running in parallel with this one. Um, and um, this is uh, a collaboration with uh, a group at um, the University of East London who have been focusing on using machine learning to analyze uh, human personality data, mainly BFI and uh, and uh, uh, MBTI data. So I gave them a huge chunk of CBAR data and said, "Could you could you see whether you can find?" Um, groups of dogs that are similar in terms of their CBOC scores, but distinct from other groups of dogs. I just gave them that as a kind of task. And they went away and they did this k-means clustering method and something called feature important analysis. And they uh, used it to identify groups of dogs um, that share these distinctive CBOC phenotypes. Uh, they just a thing with k-means clustering is you have to decide how many clusters you want. Um, they just used a visual method, the elbow method, uh, to decide that five was probably about the best number of clusters. They did try models involving four clusters and six clusters, but it didn't work as well. So we stuck with the, um, uh, the five cluster model. And... Um, we get this really interesting kind of shape, sort of slug, serpentine slug-like shape. I, I don't, don't set too much store by this. This is, I mean, the, it's a it's a way it's a, a way of representing multi-dimensional space in two dimensions. So it's very distorted. So don't don't hang too much on it. Uh, but it what it does show is that the clusters are coming out pretty distinctive. There's not much overlap between clusters. There's a bit here and um you know there's some here where uh, there's some overlap but overall the clusters are coming out is rather distinct um they're just numbered from zero to four here in colors so we've got um cluster zero is up here and cluster three is right over here with no association at all with um uh, cluster four sorry cluster zero um and uh, but these Tisney plots are not the best. I'd like to see it uh, visualized in a better way. Uh, anyway, when we got that, we needed to label these clusters in some way, meaningful way. So we use this feature importance analysis. This is just the extent to which the different CBARC items and all along here 
are, so, so to speak, uh, defining the cluster, if you like. So how important they are in defining the cluster. And we arbitrarily decided just to do a cutoff at 20, the 20 most important. It's very arbitrary. You could have chosen another thing. Um, but then when you do that, uh, sorry about the chart. Oh, I'm not allowed to walk. Sorry. Um, <laughs> you've got, um, uh, these are the, are the CBARC items here, just, and this is, you know, their description. So this is hyperactive, restless, trouble settling down. Uh, this is its feature importance value. It's top of the most, the most influential uh, variable. What we did was we measured the mean uh, for the dogs in that cluster. And then we compared it with the mean of the dogs in the other four clusters. And if it was more, as in this case, we then argued, okay, so that what's this particular sea bark item is defining this cluster and it, it's associated with dogs that are showing higher scores for hyperactivity and so on um, down the line. And based on that, we say, okay, well, these are the items where these dogs are high, hyperactive, excitable, attachment and attention seeking and showing separation related problems. They're generally low on fearfulness. So we're calling this group of dogs excitable hyperattached. And just another example here, these dogs in uh, cluster two are high for dog aggression and high for predation, chasing, but they're low for all of these. So attachment and attention seeking, separation problems, hyperactivity, and aggression and fear towards people. So they're kind of a mirror image of the previous cluster in a way. Um, and we're calling them aloof predatory. <laughs> and you get these five clusters now. Uh, so this is that first one, cluster zero, excitable, hyperattached. This is the aloof and predatory one. This one we're calling fearful, anxious. They show high levels of fear of dogs, fear of strangers and non-social fear. Uh, they're low on aggression in all contexts, and they're low on chasing and predation. These guys are just high on all kinds of aggression. Um, they're touch sensitive and they're noise reactive, but they're not low on anything. They're all high. And these guys are high on trainability, but low on everything else. So they're low on aggression, low on excitable, low on chasing and predation, tension seeking, fear of people. And we're calling them calm and agreeable, and these ones reactive and assertive. It, then they may not be the best labels. Then we may ch choose to change the labels in the future, but they're there for the moment. Um, and it then occurred to me, well, let's let's test this whole thing. Well, first of all, we tested to see whether the same personality factors came up in a se totally separate dog population. We used the seeing eye dog data set we already had, and it did. They've got same five factors, so, sorry, same five clusters. Um, and we th then said, well, okay, the prediction would be that uh, if we're looking at seeing eye dogs, we should have more calm, agreeable dog. Sorry, we should have more successful dogs among the calm, agreeable dogs and less successful dogs in the reactive, assertive types or in the aloof or predatory types. And uh, that's very nicely what we found. Uh, it's not it's not very accurate. So a lot of slop, a lot of dogs in the wrong groups. But generally speaking, it's 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 confirming that. So 72% of the dogs in that calm agreeable category cluster are successful versus only 59% in the reactive assertive and uh, the aloof predatory uh, is 64%. So it's going it, the pr prediction was confirmed. I think we have to bear in mind that even though a dog might be in this labeled category of aggressive, assertive, or whatever, that doesn't mean it's necessarily a very aggressive or assertive dog. It's just higher than the, the average for those other four groups. So future plans, uh, I'm looking forward to seeing how membership of these different personality clusters are affected by sort of other things, risk factors, as it were. Um, so breed, I'm sure breed is going to be enormously influential. I think, you know, some breeds we know what we think of as being aloof and predatory, like the 
so-called uh, ancient breeds, the, the Malamutes and the Siberian Huskies and so on. Um, and similarly, sort of Labradors, I would anticipate would be clustered in with the calm, agreeable dogs. Uh, so there's a lot to be done there. I'd love to see if these personality types are related to genotypes, but I don't know whether we'll get the chance to do that. And uh, further work we're doing now is looking to see if we can use these, use machine learning to improve the predictive performance of both the original CBARG and the working dog CBARG. We've got some nice initial results with the CI data set. Uh, I think he said he got up to 87% accuracy of predicting just using the old CBARG. So with the new one, we might get even higher, but we have to collect a lot more data with it before we get there. But uh, I think that's it pretty much. Yep. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Yeah. I'm wondering if instead of looking at these individual <clears throat> clusters and their predictive abilities, that it's more like these are dials. So there might be a profile that gets more successful. That might be a better way of getting predictive, getting better predictive. Um, so, so maybe. Maybe can you give me an example? I'm trying yeah, to like so you have these five sorts of clusters, maybe a little bit of uh aloofness, predatory has a, so just a little touch of that, dial that a little bit, but dial down the fearful, anxious, mm -hmm. dial up so you have you know a signature profile of all five mm. not any one thing for Yeah, yeah, I uh it's, it's a great idea, but I don't know how I do it. I, I, I know other people smarter than me who could be able to help. Yeah, the personality. <laughs> yeah. Uh, wonderful talk. Thank you. Um, so I wanted to give you a theme of your thoughts how far the can go with yeah, you uh, made it very clear at the beginning of the talk that you have, you know, long thought to see Bark as being basically an inventory problem behavior yeah. and not a personality inventory. So I'm wondering um, what you think about the possibility that um, in what, what sort of remains to be gained, that there might be something represented there that is related to positive behavior. And I guess the idea that, you know, thinking about it, that you know, probably for some behaviors, the, the absence of a negative behavior is, is negative of a positive trait, yep. but, but not always, right? There might be positive things that can't be captured just by the absence mm -hmm. of behavior. So yeah. what do you think about that? I absolutely agree. It, it upsets a lot of the people who fill in the C bar. It's all negative. <laughs> Send me messages. It's all negative. <laughs> Why is it so negative? Um, but I'll tell you, I mean, there's an interesting story connected to that. When we've originally did the CBI, it was like 156 questions. And included in that original battery of questions were some positive stuff, like uh, sociability, uh, gregariousness, those kinds of things. And what happened was that they correlated exactly negatively with the aggression towards strangers factor. So they're like two ends of the same dimension. And we made maybe not a good choice at that time was to say, okay, well, that's not giving us anything new. We'll just drop it. We need a short as possible question. We don't want 150 items, so we'll drop some. Uh, but yeah, it was, um, in some ways, it's a decision I regret. And yes, I'm sure things like sociability and gregariousness are very critically important, especially for service dogs. Maybe that's sort of the protection dog for it. Um, it's, it's a very important uh, domain. And if I thought you know, if it was worth putting it back in, then maybe we should do it. Sorry, the audience online didn't hear your question. Ah, what was right. the question originally? <laughs> the question was. <laughs> The question was that um, the C bar is very focused on uh, behavior problems, and um, 
uh, Evan's point was that what about positive aspects of dog behavior, which are probably also very important for the success of some of these dogs, especially working assistance dogs, service dogs. And um, I don't know, did you hear my response? Did folks hear my response? If they heard my response, then I think they all heard the response. That should make sense. The question. <laughs> Great. Uh, there was a question from online from Theodora Block. Um, she says, wonderful talk. Thank you. It is great to hear about all the different ways you are exploring the data and working to improve the predictive power. As questions are added, um, for example, the working dog C bark, do you anticipate removing any older categories such as questions that were dropped in a recent analysis? Um, certainly shrinking, not necessarily dropping them completely because, you know, something like uh, aggression towards familiar people, it's very rare in these dogs because they're kind of selected not to show that type of behavior. But nevertheless, if a dog shows it, for example, at the puppy raising stage, probably these organizations do want to know about that. So my my inclination would be to leave those subscales or factors in, but just shorten them as much as possible so you don't have so many items. Uh, so you can decrease the sort of response burden for people filling in the questionnaire. Uh, uh, but that, that that would be sort of my, that would be my initial inclination. Same goes for something like non-social fear. It may not be shown by a lot of these dogs, but when it is shown, it's a big problem. So it's worth having it still there, I think. Any other in-person or online questions? I think that they have dog aging on the mind, but when you were mentioning how the puppy raises would sell the sea bark and didn't really follow, you could really see that relationship with the success of graduation, which is what they were saying in their um, results or responses. Have you ever considered or have they ever looked at doing the timeline of sea bark that's taking one at a very young age? And middle age and on an older dog. In, in terms of looking at correlations between the dog scores at the early and later right, stages? Right, right. Yeah, well, we did do Could that. You repeat the question? Oh, sorry. <laughs> so the question was, has, has anybody ever looked at um, the association between early CBARC scores and later scores, say, comparison between six months and 12 months or potentially later? Um, and we did do one study back in 2016. I think, again, it was published in Frontiers in Veterinary Science. Um, and that that study showed some interesting changes overall in certain types of behavior. For example, oh, God, I'm going to have to try and remember this. Um, I think stranger-directed aggression occurred with greater prevalence at six months but it kind of faded out by 12 months. So as the animal matured, it tended to go down. So I don't know, one interpretation might be that, you know, at six months of age, these puppies are learning about, you know, strange events, they're starting to bark. Probably the puppy raisers are starting to uh, train them not to do that uh, to some degree. And they're, they're sort of, the behavior is attenuating over time. There were other behaviors that actually increased over time. Um, but overall, there was a very strong correlation between their scores at six months and their scores at 12 months. So that's the best answer I can give at this stage. I'm not sure that anybody else. Well, Cindy did a lot of, Cindy Otto did a lot of serial evaluations of search and rescue dogs during the CBARC. Some of that is published, but that, it was published in the context of um, the mental health of their handlers. Um, and there were some changes over time. Um, which did correlate with handler mental health. These were people who had been um, had taken their dogs to the 9-11 sites um, and had obviously experienced this terrible trauma. The dogs were fine. The dogs enjoyed it, uh, but the handlers did not for obvious reasons. And, and many of them showed mental health problems down the line. And the dogs seemed to reflect those problems to some extent. They became... I don't know how to put it, badly behaved. Um, they seem to be responding badly to the handler's depression or whatever. Yeah. 
So it is noon. If if people need to leave, um, please feel free to do so. The recording of this will be posted on the CVM website. Um, for those of you who can stay, uh, Dr. Serpil will take more questions, and he's going to take one from Dr. Ray right now. <laughs> well, just to, I'm just going to yes. <laughs> Come on up. <laughs> Come on down. Just to piggyback off of Elizabeth, because I, I feel like recently, or yesterday in our meeting, we were like, what about older dogs and dog aging? And what just occurred to me, or I'm sure you know this, the Dog Aging Project, uh, an abbreviated version of the CBARC, and so as that becomes a longitudinal study, no one's published or looked at it yet, but that could be a really intriguing way. Yeah. And Cindy has a lot of serial CBARC data mm -hmm. on search and rescue dogs, which she hasn't published, I know. Oh, and cool. um, it's there for the taking. She They did annual mm -hmm. assessments using the CBARC until the dogs died. Yeah. Right? So, so it would be interesting to look at that. I'm sure she'd be happy to share it as well. She's got a lot on her plane. So if there's, oh, we have another question? Yeah, kind of on that chronological idea, has anyone done like a medical study on this? Like dogs that have high stress reactivity, did they end up having chronic diseases? Ah, uh, interesting. Uh, yeah, so <laughs> the question is whether anybody's looked at the association between sort of chronic medical problems and... Um, say, anxiety disorders in dogs, or something like that. So Nancy Dreschel at uh, Penn State did one study where she found an association between uh, high levels of um, anxiety, I think mostly non-social fear, and, and some medical conditions. Derm interesting, dermatological conditions, skin, skin, skin problems. Um, then we tr we've got a tranche of data from the, go the dog, uh, Morris, An uh, Morris Animal Foundation Golden Retriever Lifetime Health Study uh, to look at just that question. Nothing came up much in Golden Retrievers. Um, I'm still confused by that finding, but we're, we it's it's an interesting question, really interesting to look at because you know we know there are psychosomatic medical problems in humans and um, I would fully expect them to some of them to appear in dogs as well um, if they're in a sort of a chronically anxious state for a prolonged period you would expect it If there are no more questions online or in person, we'll go ahead and stop the recording. Again, you can see the recording um, once it's loaded onto the CBM website in the high lecture series, HAI lecture series, sorry. Okay. All right, let's give Dr. Kirchner a hand.